Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I was going to have Amy cover today's news yet again, but there has been quite a few developments that I really wanted to talk about, so despite the fact that the majority of my day has been spent helping my friend moving stuff, uh, that's why I'm not on camera, by the way, uh, I decided just to kind of jump in front of the microphone because I really want to talk about some of this cool stuff. So, let's begin. We'll start with AMD, just because. And, well, the website forenix.com has an update concerning Narve 12. Now, obviously, we've heard an awful lot about upcoming RDNA GPUs from AMD. In fact, even Lisa Su recently has said that they're coming in regards to higher-end uh, not, uh, Narve GPUs. Obviously that doesn't really tell us the specifications or the release date, it could mean in 25 years time, but it is confirmation that they're working on something, as if we needed it with all of the leaks. We also know that there are lower end cards, because we've seen uh, their specifications leak, it would appear that they've got uh, 24 compute units, and you know, that's pretty decent, assuming the pricing is okay. We can assume that they're going to probably compete with like the GTX uh, 1660 series, maybe up until maybe the like 2060, uh, probably not the super. Anyway, uh, moving on to today, and the um, website forenex.com, actually this uh, popped up yesterday, are reporting that AMD are sending out Linux kernel drivers for Narve 12. And there are a significant number of lines of new code, almost 1,400 of them, uh, which have been added uh, over the existing Narve 10 support. Uh, so basically around 1,100 of those lines aren't particularly interesting. They're just uh, jet auto automatically generated header files, but the patch itself does indicate that there is a new VCN, which uh, is Video Core Next, compared to what Narve 10 does. But also Narve 12 appears to, for the most part, be taking the code paths that already are there, and just minorly tweaking the code. So it doesn't look like we can ascertain what the specifications of the GPU is from this information. Hopefully that will change. It's quite interesting because uh, with the VCN, uh, once again, Video Core Next, we also, we also excuse me, saw a uh, update for Arcturus. Remember, Arcturus doesn't have a graphics IP, a graphics display capability, but while it is Vega-based, it does have an updated VCN. I covered this a couple of days ago. So it's interesting that AMD are doing this, and I wonder what the capabilities of this GPU are going to be if there is an updated VCN uh, design. But anyway, according to uh, Forenix.com, uh, Narve 12 support uh, isn't material until uh, Linux 5.4, and its merge window is in September, so it should be stable in November. But obviously, that is not necessarily a release date for the GPUs themselves. There's also been a patent from Microsoft, and this one's quite interesting because of obviously see the new Xbox, which we're expecting to see next year. The patent was actually filed in October of last year, and as I always do with patents, I'd like to remind you that one, we don't know what this patent is actually for in terms of the hardware, and two, even if the patent was filed for the purposes of Xbox, just for the sake of argument, in the end it could be scrapped, maybe they couldn't uh, make it work in the, in the time frame that they had, or it just wasn't as... Uh, good in the real world as it was in theory, whatever. So a patent does not equate to a product or a, f or a feature that actually ships. So I always like to make that disclaimer. However, the patent was discovered by the website Windows Latest. And the patent is quite interesting because, uh, and I'm going to read this bit verbatim, uh, it is built around a controller that is configured to obtain a first measure of a power load, apply a filter to obtain a first filtered power load, and then set a thermal set point based upon the at, on at least the first filtered power load value, determine a first temperature of the device, and then adjust a response in the cooling mechanism based on at least the first thermal set point. 
and then it continues to repeat this process over and over again. And so why is this? Well, basically the purpose here is for reliability and also to increase the performance of this system as much as possible. To put it in layman's terms, if you let the device get really, really hot and it's operating at like 250 degrees Celsius, well, yeah, you can probably cook an egg on it, but that's not exactly the best thing for the hardware itself. Similarly, if you don't let the device continuously ramp up in performance, or rather in thermals, when it needs to, then if you're doing something that's taxing, for the sake of argument, you're rendering a video, or you're, say, gaming, which, let's say, take the Xbox for a moment, let's say that you've got a specific stress point in a game with lots of bad guys coming at you, well, yeah, the device is going to need to work a little bit harder, because suddenly it's calculating, you know, uh, multiple bad guys in the artificial intelligence, lots of explosions and physics stuff, lots of uh, on-screen displays, maybe even some ray tracing if the developer decides to uh, incorporate that. And so what needs to happen is that you need to have the cooling system ready and able to make quick, uh, very quick changes in its performance. So in other words, whether it needs to speed up or slow down the fan and much faster speeds. And I suppose you could, if you need further, um, uh, I guess, a further mental image, you could almost say that this better links precision boost, if you take, say, or, um, the NVIDIA GPU technology, you could almost think of it as precision boost, but for cooling. So obviously with precision boost, the GPU operates at a base frequency, but it rarely ever attains that. It usually goes much higher. So if the base frequency is like 1700 megahertz or 1600 megahertz, then assuming you have adequate power going into the GPU and the GPU is in a cool enough environment and you don't have anything else throttling it and it's in a taxing workload, so a game, for example, the GPU will boost to its maximum potential. So for the sake of argument, Rather than it hitting 1750 megahertz for the boost, it may hit 1800 or 1900 or even 2000 megahertz, but that clock frequency will also continuously adjust. This is very similar as well to um, Ryzen, uh, Ryzen 3000. Uh, so, in theory, here, this may be what happens with this cooling system. To uh, give a little more insight, and this is uh, a verbatim quote from the pattern. Accordingly, examples are disclosed that relate to cooling systems and methods of operating cooling systems that may help overcome such issues. For example, instead of a raw power load measurements as an input to the cooling mechanism, a filter may be applied to power load measurements to smooth the response of the fan or other control variables in response to the power load. Such a filter may take the form of a feed-forward mechanism that acts as a time constant. The resulting smoothing helps make the changes on the cooling system less notable no less noticeable excuse me to the user compared to the unfiltered so basically that means that the fan won't go from like you know like 20 percent speed to like 100 percent speed in one second flat it will ramp up and ramp down in a in a smoother line which is less jarring as a user it's really cool and the pattern itself is as most patents are as ambiguous as possible it's as generic as possible so it certainly is not limited to uh, graphics cards or CPUs or anything else. It could basically be anything under the sun that uh, this would be applicable to. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is a real thing. It gets used in the next generation Xbox. And the final piece of news for today, but by no means the uh, least important piece of news, is actually news from Intel and their plans for discrete GPUs uh, targeting the mainstream. So, as most of you know, Intel XE will launch next year, and, well, it is a range of discrete GPUs from the company. It is, of course, powered by, or de being designed by, excuse me, Intel's graphics division, which is being headed by Raja Kadori. And there's a very interesting interview which has appeared from the YouTube channel Pro High Tech. Now, the original interview is actually in Russian, but this was subsequently translated, or at least pertinent parts of the interview were translated by a Reddit user. I'm probably going to butcher this person's name, so I'm really sorry, but I believe it's Tarakan. 
Um, but anyway, the reason that this interview is so interesting is... Uh, I'm, oh, actually, you know what? I'm just going to read it out. Our strategy revolves around price, not performance. This is according to Kaduri. First, our GPUs for everyone at the $200 price point. Then, the same architecture, but with higher amounts of high bandwidth memory for data centers. And our strategy is that in two to three years, is to release a whole family of GPUs from integrated graphics and popular discrete graphics to data center GPUs. Now, clearly, you can look at that and say, well, that's quite telling. So there's several things you can take away from this. In fact, this uh, quote is very pertinent for me because I'm currently writing a like updated Intel XC analysis. I was actually waiting for Generation 11 to formally launch, and obviously Intel have just uh, held their Create event as well, so I can certainly be a lot more accurate with my guesses, particularly given the driver leaks, which I'm going to quickly refresh your memory about in a moment. So, with 200 bucks uh, being essentially confirmed by Raj Akadori, we know that there will be GPUs in the hierarchy, which are going to be basically competing with lower-end cards from both NVIDIA and AMD, but what their performance is, who the heck knows. But he also confirmed right there that, at least from the wording, assuming this translation's accurate, that even the lower-end GPUs have high bandwidth memory on board, which would be interesting from the perspective of, like, well, cost. So there's a couple of theories you can have. The first is that there is... Um, going to just basically be Intel taking the hit financially. They just want to make their name known in the in the industry. And they're just like, you know what? Forget the profit. We just want to really jump in and make a name for ourselves and make as much of an impact in the industry as possible, which is certainly one way to go. Another possibility is its low-cost, high-bandwidth memory. Uh, this was actually doing the news quite a while ago, in fact. I believe, uh, like, HBM3 and low-cost uh, HBM was, like, something that was being discussed back in, like, uh, 2016, 2017. And um, that was being pioneered, if memory serves, primarily by Samsung. So, there is some differences. Basically, the TSV... Uh, is not as is is not as complicated. It has fewer pins. Um, regular high bandwidth memory two has uh, one thousand and twenty four for its I/O. I believe high bandwidth memory low cost is like half that, but it makes up for this by having faster pin speed. So obviously it doesn't uh, mitigate or negate the entire uh, like loss of the I/O or sorry fewer pins. But what it does do, essentially, is crank up the clock frequency. So the bandwidth isn't bad. Um, I believe it was like 200 gigabits per second, which is still pretty darn good. So what AMD, uh, sorry, what Intel could be doing here is producing a GPU which has like 400 gigabytes per second-ish of memory bandwidth, potentially. Obviously, depending on the amount of stacks they go and what design they do and so on and so on. They could also decide to have just a uh, high bandwidth memory as a cache almost with uh, memories such as GDDR6. That would be another way for them to go as well, of course. It's such an ambiguous statement by Raj Arkadori, and I will be doing a deeper analysis of this. As I said, I'm currently... Uh, reviewing an RTX 20, uh, 2070 Super, as well as a couple of other products, which is one of the reasons I've been so quiet on the channel, also doing a couple of fun analysis pieces. But I'm also working on an updated Intel XC script. And one of the um, other leaks we've had recently, of course, is the Intel driver revision. Now, the driver has since been removed from the official website. I think you can find mirrors of it, but the version uh, number was 26.20.16.9999, and it was available very briefly online. Uh, I don't know whether, to be honest, it was an accident uh, with the driver being made available. It's possible it was, given all of the product launches that have happened. After all, we've had, like, Generation 11 and blah, 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 blah. So it's possible someone at the office was just tired and forgot to remove this inf information from the drive, or these entries, excuse me, from the drivers. Another possibility is it was an accidental on purpose. Uh, 
uh, which also wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, it also does coincide with Intel's Creative Event, it coincides with uh, RTX Super Window, it coincides with uh, RDNA launch, and once again, it doesn't really matter. We know companies do these uh, accidental leaks all the time. It's just like kind of the whole PR cycle. Whatever. But from our perspective, there were four entries when referring to the discrete GPU. So there was IDG1 LP Dev, um, I think we can probably agree that LP means low performance or low power. I'm going to assume it's low power for the sake of this video. Uh, and obviously DG probably refers to discrete graphics. But then there was DG2, DG, sorry, DG2 HP 512, uh, same thing but 256 and same thing but 128. So I'm going to guess that the DG, once again, refers to discrete graphics. The 2 probably refers to a higher performance device, along with the HP, um, uh, along with HP. So that's probably reference to high performance or high, or high power. So let's assume it's uh, high power for the, for the sake of this video. 512 is almost certainly the reference to the number of, um, I was about to say compute units there, uh, of the number of execution units that are on the GPU themselves. So Ice Lake, the higher end Ice Lake uh, GPUs, actually come with 64 execution units. So each execution unit can actually execute 16 FP32 full precision per clock. So it actually works this out by 2 ALU times uh, SIMD4 times 2 OP for FP32. Each of the execution units are multi-threaded as well, and each of the execution units also has two ALUs. So what you can basically say for uh, Ice Lake and Generation 11 is that 64 execution units times uh, 16, so you just times, you take 64 times 16 times 1100, which is the clock frequency, uh, the peak clock frequency of Generation 11, and that gives you around 1.1 T-flops. So what you could do then uh, with the generation 12, it is generation 12, is you could do much the same thing. You could take 512 times 16, assuming that number is the same. For all we know, that could have changed, but obviously we need a co we need some constants here. So you could take 512 times 16, and then you can times that by a clock frequency. Honestly, I would be seriously shocked if it is the same clock frequency as what we have. So if it's 1100 megahertz, that would mean it's around 9.2 uh, T-flops. And if it's something along the lines of 1700 megahertz, it's going to be around 14 T-flops. Uh, 2100 megahertz would be 17 T-flops for these specific devices. But obviously, we don't know what performance tier those GPUs are. So is 128 execution units the GPU that's 200 bucks? Or is it one of the higher performance tiers? It's very difficult to know, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what Intel actually have planned uh, for their discrete graphics. But as I said, um, I think that's just about it for today. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, well, you know what to do. You can subscribe to the channel for much more information. And you can also find us, of course, linked on social media, which is in the description of this very video. And if you so desire, you can find us on Amazon affiliate links. And also Patreon, which, as you guessed, is in the description of this very video as well. Thanks very much for watching, take care of yourselves, and bye for now.